بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وبعد رب شرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل الأقدة من لساني يفقه قولي My dear and respected viewers and listeners السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته I welcome you all to our daily juz summary Inshallah ta'ala today we will be looking at juz 18 and we have two surahs more or less which form this Jews 18, Surah Al-Mu'minun, about eight pages long. And then we have Surah An-Nur and a couple of pages of Surah Al-Furqan, but the majority of that Surah really is in Jews 19. Surah Al-Mu'minun means the believers. So as you can understand, this Surah will very much talk about the believers and describe what the believers are, what are their traits and qualities. And that exactly is what this Surah uh, describes. And there is no other chapter in the Quran which more than once on, on, on a couple of really strong and long sections describes some of the traits and qualities of true believers like this surah does. And that's why I believe uh, the chapter was named Al-Mu'minun, the believers. This surah was revealed in, in most probably late Meccan period as well. So this is one of the, this is actually the last uh, Meccan surah that we have in this stretch, and then surah and nur, uh, as you will hear, is like a, a, a revelation from Medina, middle period in Medina. So let us look at this uh, surah, Al Mu'minun. It's not a very long uh, surah, as I said, about eight pages long, but there are a couple of sections I would like to focus on. So the opening statement says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Qad aflah al Mu'minun. The believers will indeed succeed or the believers have indeed succeeded so who are the believers and uh, eventually they will all win okay they will triumph yeah they will win through you can say but who are they those who humble themselves in their prayers so the first trait which is mentioned in this section in the quran is that when they pray their prayers, they pray it with khushu'a, what we call khushu'a, yeah, humility. So they're fully concentrated, they're present in their prayer with their mind and heart. So this is important. Then also they avoid, those who avoid vain talk, they avoid talking nonsense, vain talk. And then beyond that, those who are active in deeds of charity, like they give out their zakat. And in Ramadan, like now, of course, it's the best time of the year when all of our good deeds, you know, whatever it is, a prayer, uh, giving in charity, smiling, whatever you do, actually, uh, fasting, your deeds are basically multiplied, many, many folds which is also true for us giving our zakat. So that's why most Muslims, since the beginning of Islam, it seems like, they all made it a practice, a really good uh, habit to give out our annual zakat, alms, uh, taxes, or charity, if you want to say, which is compulsory, exactly during this blessed month of Ramadan to cleanse our wealth, purify our wealth in that way. So zakat, uh, they give uh, and they pay it duly. And then the next two ayah, three actually ayahs, mention those who safeguard their private parts, except if they are in a legal, lawful, licit marriage. So if you are in a marriage, uh, you have exchanged your vows and tied the knots, then uh, you are allowed to uh, have intimate relations it is not shameful whatsoever it's actually rewardable but outside of that bond of the marriage bond uh, it will be considered uh, as, as a major sin so that also is a very important trait and quality of true believers they safeguard their private parts and then he goes those who faithfully observe their trust and covenants so aman and ahad okay both of these like Trust. We've been entrusted something. We are a trustee of something. You need to fulfill that trust. Okay? Observe it. And then if you promised someone something, you made an agreement or a promise, a covenant, then you again fulfill your covenant. 
then again, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the actual prayer. But here he says, and those who strictly guard their prayers. So they pray with humility. When they pray, they pray with khushu is the first trait, but they still pray. Here Allah says, but they establish their prayers properly. They don't miss any of their uh, obligatory prayers. They strictly guard their prayers. They, they are alert and they don't miss their prayers. It is these who will be the heirs, who will inherit paradise, and they will dwell therein forever. So this is the opening section of Surah Al-Mu'minun, and I, I hope you have understood this section, subhanAllah. It, in a very clear, nice language, it mentions uh, who are the true believers, what are their traits, and obviously giving them glad tiding, like they will indeed succeed. So faith indeed leads to humility and also avoidance of vanity, which is in word and uh, deed as well in giving charity, being kind and charitable, in being content, and also faithfully observing our trusts and agreements, and as I said, being punctual on our prayers. These are the traits which are mentioned in here, but you will see uh, there's one more place in this surah where some other traits and other things are mentioned which are also important. So this section, in my opinion, is quite strong. Uh, then we have this ayah, this is not the only place in Surah and uh, Al-Hajj, the previous chapter, we had also this kind of ayah or mention, very similar, with a similar meaning, talking about the creation of human being, how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us. He said, وَلَقَدْ خَلَقْنَا الْإِنسَانَ مِنْ سُلَالَةٍ مِنْ طِيلٍ In Surah, of course, uh, Al-Hijr as well, we have the notion, but in this Surah and Surah Al-Hajj, quite detailed explanation. Man, we did create from a piece of clay. Then we placed him as a drop of sperm in a place of rest, firmly fixed. Then we made the sperm into a clot of congealed blood, yeah, clot of blood. Then of that clot, we made a lump. Then we made out of that lump, lump is fetus, uh, bones, and clothed the bones with flesh. We put flesh on the bones. Then we developed out of it like another creature. So blessed be Allah, the best of creators. After that, at length, you will die. And again, on the day of resurrection, will you be raised up? Or on the day of judgment, you'll be raised up. So, uh, subhanallah, like, you know, nowadays when we read this, okay, so what, we all know that, we all more or less know, and, uh, you know, especially people who are older and married maybe and have children, they've all gone to ultrasound scans, and they've been told this is what happens during the pregnancy and this and that, but if you think about it like this, 1400 years, do you really think that people knew what was going on, and as the tummy is growing bigger and bigger and bigger, uh, of, of, of a female that is pregnant. They didn't know much. So this explanation is, uh, according to the contemporary findings, yeah, scientific findings, it's intact, exact, precise. What does that tell you and I? It tells us that Allah is the one who created us. Allah knows exactly what happens to us. In fact, in Surah uh, Az-Zumar, yes, later on, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even says to us, like, even mentions the gender. He knows whether it's going to be a male or a female. Now, scientifically, we don't know straight away, but we can find out quite pretty soon uh, what it would be. And of course, later on in the pregnancy, more or less now, the tests are quite reliable. The gender is more or less established by a lot of screening and examining. Uh, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us of these things in, in his holy book uh, almost 1500 years ago when we didn't have any of that equipment, but still, uh, you know, we were, we, we were told in such a great detail, yeah, informed uh, about the process of us growing up in the wombs of our moms. So it's, it's quite, you know, you can say uh, amazing, yeah, almost like a miracle in itself to have had, 
to, to have had that kind of information so, so long ago. Okay, um, now I'll move to the next section. In this surah, we also have, uh, again, an, an account, like a short story of Sayyidina Nuh, alayhi salatu wasalam, and this old ancient argument that people always held, uh, like, uh, are we really going to be resurrected once we have died and, and our bodies have turned into dust? Uh, and the argument that ah, it's all about this worldly life and there's nothing after it. It's all about dunya and enjoying ourselves here. And that's it. We will never be raised again up. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes mention of that. So Sayyidina Nuh, uh, his story is mentioned here. And Musa is mentioned as well, again, an encounter with Fir'aun. And also uh, Sayyidina Maryam and Isa, Isa ibn Maryam, uh, in a way. So, and Harun. So Musa and Harun both are mentioned by name as well. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes mention of these, you know, uh, arguments which non-believers, those people who can't understand the revelations, they put. So they said, uh, does he, this Prophet Muhammad, promise that when you die and become dust and bones, you shall be brought forth again, like uh, raised again? Far, very far is, is that which you are promised, like uh, that is impossible, can't happen. And they say there is nothing but our life in this worldly life, in this world. We shall die and we live, but we shall never be raised up again. Uh, and they would accuse usually their prophets of this and this and that. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us later on, when the time of resurrection comes, when the actual hour, the time comes, those non-believers will plead, they will call upon Allah, ask, give us another chance, send us again back to this earth, we're going to worship you, only you, we won't do anything wrong. And we're going to be good and kind in charity and establish our prayers. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will say, that's too late. No one has a second chance in this regard. So in that se segment, this surah is quite strong, I have to say. But let me read uh, uh, this other section, which mentions uh, some other, you can say, qualities or traits of true believers, uh, which are also important. So it's in section four. The beginning is actually, Ya Yuhar Rusulu, or you messengers, enjoy all things good and pure, and do righteousness. For I'm well aware of all that you do. And verily, this brotherhood of yours is a single brotherhood, nation. Yeah, nation is a single nation, is Muslim, Islam. And I am your Lord and cherisher, therefore fear me uh, and no other than me. And in Surah al anbiya that we covered yesterday, same I am more or less, but the ending was, so worship me and no other than me. But people have cut off their affair of unity, like they, they disunited, okay, uh, between them. And they split into sects. And each sect or party rejoices in that which is with itself. So every camp is basically saying they are the best, they've got the truth, and, 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 and speak in that way. But leave them, Allah says to Muhammad, in their confused state for a time. Yeah, confused ignorance in a way. Uh, do they think that because we have granted them abundance of wealth and sons, they make thus conclusions, we would hasten them on in every good? Nay, they clearly don't feel it. They, they don't get it. They don't understand. It. Okay, they don't understand it. But verily those who live in awe for fear of their Lord, and these are the traits, yeah, those who believe in the signs of their Lord, those who join not in worship partners with their Lord, and those who dispense their charity with their hearts, full of fear, because they will return to Allah and they know it for sure. It is these who hasten in every good work, and these who are foremost in them. On no soul do we place a burden greater than it can bear. Before us is a record which clearly shows the truth, the book of deeds. They will never be wronged. Uh, but their hearts are in confused state, ignorance of this all. And, they, and there are, besides that, deeds of theirs, 
which they will continue to do until when we cease in punishment those of them who receive the good things of this world, behold, they will then groan in supplication. But it will be said to them then, groan not in supplication on this day, for you shall certainly not be helped by us. My sons used my signs verses used to be rehearsed to you. They came to you, but you used to turn your back. Yeah, turn back on your heels. Now listen to that. In arrogance, talking nonsense about the Quran, about the ayahs, the signs, like one telling fables by night, like uh, telling tales. Do they not ponder over the word of Allah? Or has anything new come to them that did not come to their fathers of old? Or do they not recognize their messenger that they deny him? Or do they say he is possessed? No, he has brought to them the truth. But most of them hate the truth. They don't want it. They hate it. Al-Haqi karihun. They dislike it. If the truth had been in accord with their desires, truly the heavens and the earth, and all beings therein would have been in confusion and corruption. Nay, we have sent them their admonition, but they turn away from their admonition. So, you know, this is a very strong, you know, uh, section, I have to say, as if he's directly talking to each and every person nowadays who, in, who constantly and purposefully chooses to ignore this message and pretends that they can't get it, they don't understand what they... They turn their back on it. So it's a very strong, and as you can see, like most of the foolish arguments that people put forward nowadays, they were put forward by people before us. So we don't, we shouldn't assume that people today are much more intelligent than people who lived 2,000 years ago or even 6,000 years ago. We shouldn't think that. They also had the capability to reason. You know, they had intelligence. Uh, Yet, we, yes, of course, we didn't have the technological advan advancements of today's time and age, but they were intelligent in their own ways. But still, their own intelligence, as you can see somehow, still fooled them because they couldn't see it. They couldn't understand the message. So they will keep saying the same argument, like, uh, we can't be resurrected again. Uh, it's all about this worldly life, uh, you know, our forefathers were told about it. It's you know fairy tales, this and that, all these kinds of things, myth, mythology, asatirul awalin. It's mentioned here in this surah as well. Yeah, uh, such things have been promised to us and to our forefathers before, and they are nothing but tales of the ancients. But say to them, to whom belong the earth and all beings therein? Say if you knew, man fiha. They will say to Allah. So as you can see, Arabs, like they believed in Allah in a way, like not like contemporary people don't even believe in Allah in any way. But say to them, yet will you not receive admonition? Like, why don't you then, you know, take lesson? Say, who is the Lord of the seven heavens and the Lord of the magnificent throne? They will say again, they all belong to Allah. Say, will you not then be filled with awe? Like, why, why, why don't you fear then? Like, why don't you have oh? Say to them, who is it in whose hands is the governance of all things, who protects all, but is not protected of any? Say, if you knew that, they will say again, it all belongs to Allah. Say, then how are you still deluded? Like, uh, are you bewitched? Or what, what is going on? Why don't you come back to your senses? So the Quran says, we indeed have sent them the truth, but they indeed practice falsehood. You know, they keep insisting on uh, preaching the lies and, 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 and following the falsehood. No, no son did Allah beget, nor is there any God alongside with him. If there were more than one gods, yeah, more than one God, many gods, behold, each God would have taken away what he had created. And some would have lauded over others like they will want to boss the other gods. Glory to Allah. He is free from the sort of things they attribute to him. He knows what is hidden and what is obvious. Too high is he for the partners they attribute to him. Say, O oh my Lord, 
show me show me in my lifetime that which they are warned against and then oh my lord put me not amongst those people who do wrong and we are certainly able to show you in fulfillment that against which they are warned but you instead repel evil with that which is good we are well aware of all the things that they say so this again is a very easy section i would say to understand uh, if we obviously have proper hearing, let's say, ears that can actually hear the message of, of the revelations, yeah, the message that comes from Allah, and eyes to see or brain to reason properly with. Because these are powerful things like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling uh, the people in Arabia in, in the Prophet's time, you seem to acknowledge that there is uh, like uh, a supreme creator who created the heavens and the earth, but you are, why are you worshipping idols besides him? You know, in, worship him alone. He's the only true God. So that was their mainly problem. But in today's time and age as well, but even then maybe some, we have a lot of people who can't get any of it. They just cannot understand that this, everything that exists was created by one creator, who is the only true God. And here in this section, which I read, is a rational argument really against, the possibility of dualism even or multiple gods which which is you can say polytheism or idol worshiping in in a sense like you can't worship more than one god because there is no more than one god there is only one true god and he's the only one who deserves to be worshipped okay so this is uh, you know that kind of argument and some traits of true uh, people who truly believe so uh, here I just want to read one or two more ayahs before going to the next surah. Here is what Allah says, uh, uh, what is going to happen. Yeah? So the Quran tells us about future things that will happen, the day of judgment and what's going to happen to us after we die and what we're going to do and how we're going to react after, after we see, transcend this world and see the truth, see the angels. In this life, we can't talk to them, but after we die, we will see them because the angel of death will come and take, uh, extract our soul take our soul and then we will see everything and talk and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us exactly of that uh, time he says okay until leave them until they will remain in falsehood until when death comes to one of them and there is no one who can escape this the person says oh my lord Send me back to live again in this worldly life. Send me back to live, to life, in order that I may do righteous deeds in everything I neglected. You know, like this time I'm not going to miss my prayers. This time I'm going to look after orphan children and, and, and poor and needy, but with the intention of pleasing you, not to become famous and, and this and that, or wrong intention. But it is but a word that they say. Before them is a partition till the day that they are raised. That's it. Like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows exactly what's in our mind, in our thoughts. He knows our intention. So when they see the truth and when they see that they have fooled themselves by themselves and done injustice by themselves to themselves and as a result will be punished and see the reality, the truth, I'm afraid, as the Quran says here, there's no second chance for anyone. It's only one chance. And that's why it's amazing. You know, the faith, Allah is testing us with all of this. You know, the whole life is like a trial. Allah wants to see who is going to believe and who is not. Allah wants to see who is going to go ahead and do good deeds and who will refuse and, 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 and do whatever they feel like doing. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given every one of us equal opportunity here. One chance, and that's it. Nobody has two chances or more than one chance. And in the same sense, Allah knows our intentions. And it's all about what's in your heart and my heart. It's what's in our heart. That's why this surah mentions, their hearts are in, in awe, in fear, because that's the place of piety and intention. So you and I fully intend to worship Allah forever. Okay? The iman entered my heart. I don't want it to leave my heart ever again. 
Yeah, I'm going to constantly worship Allah. If Allah gave me an eternal life in this worldly life, I'll do that. But Allah decided that my worldly life is going to be a fixed, limited period, and I'm going to be tested in it, trialed. But I still believe in Allah. Therefore, past this time, Allah knows that if he gave me another chance, I'll again behave, inshallah, good. They be like what I'm now, roughly. But the person who chose to disbelieve, even though they will ask Allah to give them a second chance, Allah will say, no, you're just saying that. It's like that story I mentioned before. Traveling on the sea, huge waves coming, storm. You think you're going to drown. You pray to God, God sends the rain away. Yeah, the clouds go elsewhere, the wind, everything, the sea settles down. You safely finish off your journey and find the, the shore. When you basically step on the land, soon after you feel safety, more secure and safety, you feel all right, immediately maybe, if you are not a good, uh, pious person who constantly remembers Allah, immediately you will basically believe you are a little bit more now independent, more, more independent, like you can manage yourself. Then few more steps, few days, few weeks, Allah says, human is like that, keeps forgetting. Again, they will go back to their old ways. They're not going to pray to Allah. They'll just do whatever they like. In the same way, Allah is saying to them on Judgment Day, you're just saying that. I know your intention. I created you. You are allies. If I sent you a hundred times, you will still want to indulge yourself in whatever you used to do when I gave you the only chance that you have had. So it's all about the intention, my brothers and sisters. And therefore, it is fair and just from Allah that he will punish those people forever because he knew their intention. He knew that they were just saying things. So uh, Allah says that, yeah, uh, uh, and, and after that, there is no going back, basically because there's barzakh, part, partition. Yeah, This partition basically means uh, a screen barrier that no one goes back to this worldly life. That's why we don't believe in tanasukh uh, al-arwah. We don't believe that anyone gets a second chance to live again life in a different body or something, in a different born again. Not like that. Uh, everyone enters this new phase, which is called barzakh, we say, until there you wait till the day they are raised up. In Until yawm yubaathun means yawm al the day of resurrection. So, and then Allah even mentions here like, oh, and the trumpet, trumpet is blown, it will be blown, and then two comes. Those who did good deeds, their deeds will be weighed on the balance, on scale, they'll be rewarded and the bad uh, will be punished. So again, when they are placed in the hellfire, they will again like raise some issues, like they'll say, put some arguments or say something to Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not going to listen to that. So here, for example, he says, were not my signs rehearsed to you, and you did but treat them as falsehood, you were belying them. And they will say, oh, our Lord, our misfortune overwhelmed us. And we became a people astray, like we were too busy to, to earn the livelihood, and this and that. Our Lord, bring us out of this. If, we, we, if ever we return to evil again, then we shall be indeed wrongdoers. And he will say, be you driven into it, yeah? And speak you not to me. So that's it. You are in there and you will be in there and stay there. Some of my servants there was. They used to pray, our Lord, we believe. Then do you forgive us and have mercy on us? Like they were doing istighfar and, and rahmah. But for you, you are the best. Who sh for you, you are the best who shows the mercy. But you treated them with ridicule. You're making fun of those people who prayed and cried and, and sought istighfar to me and uh, asked for my mercy. So much so that ridicule of them made you forget my message while you were laughing at them. Now listen, I have now today rewarded them on this day for their patience and their steadfastness, their worship. They are indeed the ones that have achieved the bliss. But for you, 
is punishment, eternal punishment. So subhanallah, it's like Allah tells us of what's going to happen on judgment day and how, you know, the uh, people who will be judged and who are wrong will put again argument. Allah will say, no, you had your chance, you missed it. Now blame yourself. Don't blame anything else. Don't blame anyone else. And then they will, uh, he will say like, what number of years did you stay on earth? Uh, like after the resurrection. And they will say, we stayed a day or a part of a day. But ask those who keep account, you stayed for a long time. He will say, you stay not but a little, if you had only knew. And did you th really then think that we had created you in jest, in vain, like for no reason? And that you would not be brought back to us for account, for reckoning? Therefore, exalted be Allah, the king, the real, the truth. There is no God but he, the Lord of the magnificent throne, the Lord of the honorable throne. Throne. So, subhanallah, it's like uh, this section sometimes really scares me as well. Like, uh, we may think this and that, we, you know, we are not so significant as you can see from this passage. We are just part of Allah's creation. And our stay in this worldly dunya was not so huge and too significant but did we really think that we were created and we we live we exist in vain just to mess about and to gratify our desires no not indeed we were made allah created us with a clear purpose to worship him and he is the one who is in charge of our lives and he will take us back to him for final reckoning so it's, it's a very straightforward and strong message, really, uh, in this surah. So it's just up to you and I to believe it, to listen to it, and to follow it or not. The next surah is Surah An Nur, which means the light. Uh, this chapter is also very, very long. Uh, it has uh, 64 ayahs, as I understand, but uh, some of the verses are quite long, you know, much longer than uh, those ayahs of Surah Al Mu'minun. This chapter is, to a lot of people, like one of their favorites, I'm sure, uh, because it talks about chastity. It talks about marriage. Uh, it talks about privacy, okay? Uh, you know, fulfilling your rights, about uh, visiting each other, uh, seeking permission to enter someone's property, eating together, uh, covering your, your, your uh, hair, for ladies, yeah, covering the hair, lowering our gaze. Some really amazing, amazing norms, or let's say principles, uh, that would basically bring so much peace and joy in our societies. But the breach of those norms and regulations would be scandalous, would be very problematic, and people just need to understand that. So uh, there are not many surahs which begin with this term, surah tun and zannaha, okay? So Allah says, a surah which we have sent down and which we have ordained, in it we have sent down clear signs in order that you may receive admonition. So right at the beginning of this surah, adultery and fornication are mentioned and the rules, like the, let's say, uh, punishment for those who, who committed them. Or you can even switch it the other way around and say there is a stern warning against adultery and fornication in this surah. So therefore, it's encouraging you to remain chaste, okay, to safeguard your private parts, like Surah Al-Mu'minun said. And if you, uh, if you still think that Islam uh, is preaching celibacy or saying that we don't get married, in order to stay pious. No, that's not what Islam says. Islam actually in this surah says, marry those among you who are single, okay? Encourages marriage, okay? And in that way, there's nothing wrong in you fulfilling your desires in that sense, uh, but it is uh, the, the sex, the intimate relation, which is out, illicit, yeah? Outside of the, uh, of the marriage bond, which is uh, criticized here and, and a clear uh, fixed punishment mentioned for it. That's why we call that a had, means a fixed punishment. And there are only a few offenses 
uh, for which in Islamic law we have fixed punishment. One of them really is fornication and adultery or all adultery. The difference between fornication and adultery, if you didn't know, is like for a married person, if they committed uh, illicit uh, intercourse, sexual act, that will be considered adultery. A non-married person, if they again commit uh, an uh, illicit intercourse, again, it's, 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 it is definitely sinful, but it is seen as fornication. Uh, and the punishment is different for a married person to the single person, for obvious reason. The married person is not desperate. He's got his spouse, wife or husband, and they can meet those needs. They can fulfill them in a halal way, which is, again, like I said before, not only halal, it's even rewardable, like uh, blessed, meritorious. So if they, beyond that, beyond their spouse, go and seek someone else, then, of course, the punishment is much graver and the sin is seen as much bigger than a single person. But don't get me wrong here. Uh, I'm not giving any excuse whatsoever because Allah doesn't. To any single person, doesn't matter how old you are and for how many years you've been seeking uh, a marriage partner and you are not uh, able to find one because it's not easy, you know, in today's time and age as well, maybe to find someone who is similar to you and suitable to you and also practicing and religious like yourself, that is not a license uh, for somebody to, uh, to go lose. Uh, you know, even fornication itself, there's a strong, severe punishment mentioned in this surah for, for it. Another issue mentioned right at the beginning is not only that, a charge against chaste woman, okay, or spouse, if, if the person who accuses someone that they committed illicit intercourse, okay, sexual activity, but they fail to produce four just witnesses, they also deserve uh, a fixed punishment, had. So there is also a, a had. Uh, on qadf, we call it. Yeah. So they also uh, get uh, 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 flogged them with 80 stripes. And also, another punishment is reject their evidence. So their testimony is not accepted again. Uh, but some scholars, they say, the next ayah says, unless they repent thereafter or soon after that and mend their behavior, for Allah is oft forgiving and merciful. Uh, some scholars say because of this, unless, except, or when, if this happens, uh, they say their testimony can be accepted if they have completely changed their, you know, like, uh, uh, conduct. You know, they became pious. Uh, you know, they repented for their sin. And Allahu alam, it seems like you can go either way. But there are some scholars who say, no. Yeah, Allah said, and reject their evidence ever after, because Allah mentioned abadan, yeah, means never after. If they repent, means Allah will accept uh, their repentance and forgive them the slander, the sin of slander, yeah, of uh, uh, a charge against the chaste person that they made. So Allah will forgive them for that, and they, you know, will have, of course, every chance to go to Jannah, but don't rely on them in terms of testimony because if they've done it once, what's uh, going to promise you that they might not lie again? Yeah, bring a false charge. So that one. Uh, and then in this section two of this surah is the incident of uh, Al-Ifq. Those who brought forward the, uh, the lie are a body among yourself, like a few people from the Sahaba, thinking not to be an evil to you, on the contrary, it is good for you. Okay, so what is this? Is the hadith, uh, the incident of if, yeah, uh, slander again, accusation, yeah, accusing uh, Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha of indecent action, like, and she obviously didn't do anything, but her, uh, let's say, innocence, okay, so bara'a was, you know, her certificate of innocence, I should say, shahadatul bara'a came by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because it's a big thing accusing a mother of a believer, one of the prophet's wives of indecent act is enormous, huge thing. Yeah, buhtanun azim, uh, huge, big, great, you know, big penalty. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala came and freed her, yeah, and said that she was innocent, completely innocent. And then set a precedent with this incident, with this story, uh, 
inshallah, I hope people take admonition from it and they never ever uh, accuse a chaste lady or a man of indecent action if they, if they don't have concrete evidence for it. Okay, so Allah says here, you can read this whole section, I don't have much time left, but uh, he says like, why did not the believers, men and women, when they heard of the affair, put the best construction on it in their own minds and say, this charge is an obvious lie. If Kunmubin, like, this is a lie, slander. Why did they not bring four witnesses to prove it? You can't make a claim and then have no evidence for it or witnesses. When they have not brought the witnesses, such men in the sight of Allah stand for themselves as liars. This is what I'm saying. Like, you just think in Islam, or I mean, like, you just think in upright conduct, let's say, muru'a. It's okay just to make up any claim. No, you can't make up claims. When you, like, you know, uh, make an accusation of someone, like, if even in modern society, in secular countries, yeah, and police is around, and you make an accusation, you accuse someone, police is going to say, oh, that's a mighty charge, you know, that's a, uh, that's a serious accusation that you are making against this person. Are you serious? And are you actually aware uh, this can all go against you? This is an offense in itself to make such a serious accusation against someone. If you don't prove it, you will be penalized. This is normal. So the Quran says, those are the ones who are seen as liars. Were it not for the grace and mercy of Allah on you in this world and the hereafter, indeed a, a painful penalty would have seized you in that you rushed yeah, uh, into this affair, like you rushed talking about it, like you just heard this, oh, can you believe it, can you hear it? spreading this rumor and, 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 and slander. So, a uh, big warning, behold, you received it on your tongues, and said out of your mouth things of which you had no knowledge, and you thought it to be a light matter, while it was most serious in the eyes of Allah, in the sight of Allah. And why did you not, when you heard it say, it is not right for us to speak of this, it's not right of us even to listen to this, to hear it. Glory to you, our Lord. This is a most serious slander ever, like a most serious slander it's a it's a great slander allah does allah admonishes you that you may never repeat such conduct if you are true believers if you are true believers or if you are believers and allah makes the signs plain to you clear for allah is full of knowledge and wisdom those who love to see scandal published broadcast among the believers will have a, a painful penalty Gravious penalty in this life and in the next life. Allah knows and you do not know. And again, were it not for the grace and mercy of Allah on you, and that Allah is full of kindness and mercy, you would be ruined. Subhanallah. That's what it was like. Because Allah is so merciful and so much grace, uh, you know, and gentleness and softness from his side towards us and our mischievous behavior, Allah didn't punish those people then. And he otherwise he would have sent a painful punishment on them there and then. So the warning immediately after that is, all you who believe, follow not shaitan's footsteps. Okay? Uh, if any will follow the footsteps of shaitan, he will but command what is shameful and wrong. Okay? And if he wasn't really the grace and mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you would have, you know, you, we wouldn't have purified. We wouldn't have reached. None of you would have ever have been purified, reach that state. But Allah purifies whomever he pleases. And Allah is the one who, who hears everything and knows everything. So <clears throat> very strong, you know, uh, session. And even this, like, because people repented, of course, after this slander of Aisha, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told say, uh, say Abu Bakr, for example, who was really annoyed with this one person whom he used to support financially. And he's the one who basically came up with the rumor in the first place, he just was angry with him, didn't want to support him financially anymore, giving charity to him. But in a way, Allah says, don't you love Abu Bakr to be forgiven if you made a mistake by Allah? Allah is forgiving. Forgive him, he repented, and keep giving him in charity. Something like that. So he actually, we have this ayah, and then 
these other ayahs from Surah Al-A'la, for example, where most scholars, they say, the person who was truly pious and kept giving in charity, uh, who will have great reward in the next life, primarily was uh, talking about Abu Bakr early on. But uh, there are many Mufassir who say, yes, it's true, it was revealed because of his behavior and his incidents. So he was like, we say the occasion of the revelations, but the meaning and the pattern applies to any other believer who follows his example. So he set up, you know, a, a huge, you know, good uh, example, high example, not easy to follow, but we will try to emulate it. So again, in this surah, I need to redecide to you. On the day of judgment, when their tongues and their hands and their feet will bear witness against them as to their action, on that day, Allah will pay them back and they're just Jews, and they will realize that Allah is the very truth that makes all things manifest. So on judgment day, when it comes to like, you can't make a claim because even your own limbs are gonna witness against you if that is what is needed. The rest of this surah, I'm afraid I don't have much time, is all about privacy in the home. Uh, and it's all like uh, as a nature of virtue, it's all good. Uh, we are not allowed to, to basically, you know, walk into somebody's house without knocking, without notice, or actually grant, without being granted the permission to enter. Uh, that's one thing. Secondly, the Quran very strongly and nicely says here, say to the believing men that they should lower their gaze and guard their modesty. That's much closer to purity for them. Yeah, chastity, it's, it's much better for them. And say to the believing women, that they should also lower their gaze and guard their modesty, that they shouldn't display their beauty and ornaments, except what must ordinarily appear thereof, that they should draw their veils over their, uh, uh, their chests, yeah, blouses, and not display their beauty, except to their husbands, their fathers, their husband's fathers, their sons, their husband's sons, their brothers, or their brother's sons, or their sister's sons, or their women, or the slaves with whom their right hand possesses, so they can't marry them, or male servants, free of physical needs, they, they can't have the desire, or small children who don't have sense of the shame of sex yet, and that they should not strike their feet in order to draw attention to their hidden ornaments, and all you believers, turn you all together male and female, towards Allah, so that you may attain bliss, that you may succeed. Marry um, those among you who are single, or the virtuous ones amongst your slaves, male and female. If they are in poverty, Allah will give them means out of his grace. For Allah he encompasses all and he knows all. So, uh, subhanAllah, this uh, section as well is very nice, very beautiful. But what, what one thing I wanted to notice in the ayah I just read, how much detail Allah says like uh, hijab, yeah? Talking about hijab. Who it is that our uh, Muslim ladies should cover in front and, uh, and, and, and they can show their hair in, in front of who? But no grown-up person, yeah? Let's say beyond the age of 12 or something like that, 14, 12 for girls, maybe 14, 15 or for boys. They can't show their private parts or uncover so much of their body, even in front of their parents or siblings or grandparents. So it's, you know, the norms of privacy, modesty is very much emphasized. The one ayah, which I can't really uh, explain here, but uh, can just mention briefly, is the ayah called Ayah to Noor, the, the verse of the light. That's why this surah was called after it is ayah 35, please read this ayah, uh, you know, in your own sp uh, spare time and the next few, because it's truly amazing. Allah is the light. Allah gives us this parable, uh, comparing Allah with light, okay? Allah is the light of the heavens and the earth, the parable of his light. So Allah is not the light, okay? Is the parable of his light, okay? As Allah is like light, okay? Is as if there were a niche and within it a lamp. The lamp encloses in glass, the glass as it were a brilliant star, kawkab, lit from a blessed tree, zayt, yeah, an olive tree, neither of the east nor of the west, whose oil is well high, yeah, well 
nice and luminous. Yeah, though fire scarce touches it, light upon light. Allah does guide whomever he wills to his light. Allah does set forth, forth parables, examples for man, and Allah does know all things. Lit is such a light in houses which Allah has permitted to be raised to honor for the celebration in them of his name. In them is he Allah glorified. So uh, the houses raised here, obviously here Allah talks about mosques, yeah, a house of Allah. So a uh, very beautiful parable, amazing, you know, like a lot of explanations. There are some people who have written books just trying to explain this ayah like a booklet they have written. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us onto the light. That's what I, I can say, a beautiful parable. Uh, so Allah is like telling us uh, the parable of his light uh, is like this parable, which is mentioned in this ayah. And what a beautiful description it is, reassuring indeed. And one final note on this surah and nur Allah says at the end of this surah, uh, do not uh, deem not the summon of the messenger of Allah amongst yourself like the summons of one of you to one another. So when the prophet of Allah says to us, do this and that, we can't consider that as if my parents told me that or my peer or my friend. Uh, what Allah's messenger tells us is like sam'an wa ta'a. We hear and we obey as if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us. I will end my explanation here. And as I said, it's only a couple of pages from Surah Al-Furqan that are part of this Jews. So I will start from Surah Al-Furqan tomorrow, inshallah ta'ala. Jazakumullah uh, khair. Uh, I'll just see uh, again. I can't load my page. I don't know why. Uh, okay, I think I have one question. Uh, uh, why should not like uh, that's not the reason really you know Ali was not you know like uh, didn't say you know when 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 the truth was revealed by Allah uh, you know it's not that Ali didn't defend her and kept quiet or something like that not like that he wasn't like that they were all nice don't ever think that there was any rift and, and ill feelings between them at that time all of that came afterwards by some followers who, who fancied Ali over Aisha, and, and on the other hand, those who fancied Abu Bakr and Aisha and Zubair over the other camp. That's unfortunate split in, in our religion, but it was not there. I, I'm fully uh, convinced at the time of these revelations and at the time of the Prophet. Okay, major sins, I've tried. Okay, so you have to keep trying, you know, just keep repenting until inshallah one day you understand the severity of your mistake and you don't go back to it. That's the whole point. So never try to give up. doesn't matter how major your sin is and how many times you have committed it. Keep repenting to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sincerely and Allah one day uh, you will soften your heart, give you proper understanding of it. You will do something, something will happen in your, in your life and you will understand there will be a shield between you and that particular sinful act that is your weakness at the moment. So pray to Allah especially for that. Uh, competing good actions. Uh, at this, okay, I can understand it. Okay, I didn't bring my head. That's personal, uh, because I have many duties after this, and my head is very heavy to wear. If a, a Muslim accuse a non-Muslim woman, uh, that's a good question. Uh, yeah, the ruling is different uh, because uh, the rules of fornication ad and adultery and also of slander applies to Muslims only, you know, the, the strict punishment. So no uh, fixed punishment in Islam or non-fixed punishment, which can be prescribed by uh, judges, a panel of judges or a ruler, uh, applies to any non-Muslim. So non-Muslim can never be really punished according to Islamic laws because the Islamic laws, rules and regulations don't apply to them. But if a Muslim uh, accused uh, another Muslim, then we follow strictly the letter of law here. If a Muslim accused another person and that person was a non-Muslim but in a marriage with a Muslim, then he could probably be punished more or less equally of this punishment because the punishment of slander applies to the Muslim, and he is a Muslim who accused, he or she could be a female as well. 
but as I said, the non-Muslim, if he was a non-Muslim accusing, or the non-Muslim uh, was the person who was involved in fornication, then uh, the rule of uh, fornication can't apply to them. But if one of the party was a Muslim, that party will be punished according to this rule. Like that, something like that. So it's not necessary that both parties involved are Muslim in adultery and fornication, and that both parties are in accusation and slander uh, recipient or the accuser as well. But the rules of Islam apply only to Muslims. That's the normal, you know, maxim, general, general maxim. Okay, I think I answered all of your questions. Can't, this one question, I can't read it fully. Uh, create a structure, private houses, Okay, let me try to in Jamaat's compete in good deeds. Some of them meet in mosques, others attached. Others like to create independent networks and meet in private houses, create a structure and assign a lecture among themselves and so on. Is their action better? Okay, okay, okay. I can't really fully understand your question. Uh, I can't fully understand your question, but if your question is like uh, praying in a mosque and doing some good noble work inside the mosque, a house of Allah, is that more meritorious than in a private house? Yes. There are many scholars who say the best prayer is prayed in Jama'at, you know, pray on time in Jama'at, and then on time in Jama'at in a mosque is the best behind the Imam. So in terms of merit, that's the best. Uh, but it's all really, you know, like the quantity of your reward, it, it really is linked with your intention, the purity of your intention. So, you know, maybe there are many people who come to mosques regularly, but they will not get anything from their coming to mosque. May Allah save us and protect us from it, uh, you know, uh, because they've done it for wrong intention or whatever. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, purify our intentions. That's the key message here. Uh, save, uh, enable us to safeguard our private parts you know, meant to maintain our chast chastity, uh, honor, uh, and help other people as well to, 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 to safeguard their own honor and chastity as well. Uh, and we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he makes us fit the description of those true believers that are mentioned in Surah Al-Mu'minun, and also those who, who follow good uh, rules and regulations that are mentioned in Surah An-Nur. أَقُولُ قَوْلِ هَذَا وَاسْتَغْفِرُ اللَّهِ الْعَظِيمَ لِي وَلَكُمْ فَاسْتَغْفِرُهُ إِنَّهُ الْغَفُورُ الرَّحِيمُ سبحانك اللهم نستغفرك ونتوب إليك ونصلي ونسلم على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا بارك الله فيكم والعفو منكم والسلام عليكم ورحمة 